Yeah. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shall I start, Dr. Suranga? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I welcome you all to uh, the September edition of uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine uh, Therapeutic Forum. Uh, today have a, we have a special guest uh, from India uh, to speak up uh, speak uh, to speak to us about uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, may I welcome uh, Dr. Suranga Manilgama, uh, President Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, to address the gathering. Thank you, Ranga. Good evening, everyone. I warmly welcome all of you who have joined virtually to the today's therapeutic forum conducted by Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. I extend a special note of welcome to the speaker. Today is Dr. Devdatta Chafekar, consultant nephrologist, who I got to know when I was uh, attending to a conference in India. And uh, the, I was listening to his talk, and it was a wonderful talk. So after listening to his talk, I invited him to deliver uh, this to uh, our audience. And he accepted the invitation. And thank you for accepting the invitation. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our coordinator, uh, uh, Dr. Ranga Gunasekara, for organizing this lecture series uh, seamlessly. And I appreciate the technical support given by the Gates Pharma. And finally, once again, I thank all of you uh, who participate virtually uh, for today's uh, uh, lecture. Without further ado, I have uh, I hand over the uh, mic to uh, Dr. Ranga to introduce the uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranga Manikam. Uh, Dr. Uh, Diodatta Shafika, uh, MD Medicine, DNB Medicine, uh, DM Nephrology, DNB Nephrology, FISN, FASN, FICP, FACP, FISCCM, FISOT, FGSI, FRCP London. He is the Director and Consultant Nephrologist, Supreme Kidney Care, Nasik, Professor of Medicine, Dr. V. N. Power Medical College, Nasik, Ex President, Indian Society of Nephrology, West Zone Chapter, Ex President, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, Nasik Chapter. He has fellowships in International, International Society of Nephrology, Denver, USA, International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, Toronto, Canada. He is a consultant nephrologist, Medicawa Hospital, Nasik, and Shradri Hospital, Nasik. He is a honorary nephrologist for Government Super Specialty Hospital, Ayurvedic Seva Sangha Rugnala, Nasik, HAL Hospital, Oza. He has been training many undergraduates and postgraduate students to the date, and he has presented papers in many national and international platforms. He has several publications to his name, and he has been a principal investigator for several multi-center clinical trials. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Diodatta Shafika. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ranga, for that uh, elaborate introduction. And uh, I must also thank Dr. Suranga for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you all regarding uh, this particular topic, which is acute kidney injury. So I hope that my slides are visible. I've just shared my slides. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, CME. And I hope that at the end of this uh, talk, uh, we will feel that our time was well spent. Now, the topic is acute kidney injury, a high value care. And why is it high value? It is high value because if you manage to bring the kidneys around from uh, renal failure, then we have done a great job <clears throat> because we know that almost 30% of patients who develop AKI, they go into chronic kidney disease. And therefore, it is should be our endeavor to be very, very aggressive as far as treatment of AKI or acute kidney injury is concerned. And that will definitely give us great dividends as far as this topic is concerned. Now, let me tell you some figures for AKI. 
So they are in front of you. Here you can see that in the United States, almost 300,000 people die due to AKI annually, putting all uh, hospitals together. And the cost of treatment is phenomenally high. I'm sure that this is true all over the world because these patients are very sick and they require multiple specialists who will be seeing them in the ICU. Almost 3.5% of all admissions in the hospital can be attributed to AKI. And as the length of the stay increases, the mortality, morbidity, as well as the cost also increases. And interestingly, if you look at the death rates related to conditions like prostate cancer, breast cancer, heart failure, diabetes, etc., etc., you can see here that the death rates due to acute kidney injury are much higher as compared to all these other conditions which I mentioned. So a person has a lesser chance of dying due to diabetes and its complications as compared to AKI due to any etiology. And it is also seen that the odds of death, that means the chances of mortality, would be higher if the renal failure is worse as compared to before. So therefore, the amount of damage to the kidney would also determine whether the patient has got a good outcome or no. So as you can see in this table, you can see that there could be various types of acute kidney injury. So you can have what is called as a community acquired AKI. The incidence is not very high. And usually there's only one reason why the kidneys are affected. And this is due to either sepsis or dehydration infection and rarely it can also be due to some medications. So therefore, community acquired AKI, the incidence is less than 1%. The other type of AKI which we see in the admitted people is the hospital acquired acute kidney injury, where the incidence is not so low, almost 2 to 20%. But here, the cause of AKI can be due to multiple reasons together. So, for example, you can have volume depletion, sepsis and hypotension, nephrotoxic drugs, radiocontrast-related injury. All these things are occurring together in a hospital-acquired AKI. And then the third more sinister category is the ICU-acquired AKI, where the incidence is higher. We see a lot of patients in the ICU who develop AKI. And here, surely enough, it is multifactorial because there are many things which are happening together. For example, the patient can be in a post-operative state with a multi-organ failure, with a cardiac issue, with receiving the nephrotoxic drugs. So therefore, as we see community acquired versus hospital acquired versus the ICU acquired AKI, the amount of renal injury, mortality and morbidity is definitely different. And in general, if a patient is admitted to the ICU, the mortality exceeds more than 50% in many cases in spite of a lot of improvements in the medical care. So therefore, AKI is a common serious problem and 25% of ICU dialysis survivors progress to end-stage renal disease within three years. So as I mentioned initially, that it is our endeavor to diagnose AKI early to treat it optimally and to prevent progression to chronic kidney disease because almost 25% of patients who are on dialysis for AKI, they progress to chronic kidney disease. So this is just a figure which is published in JAMA uh, way back in 2005. And here you can see that this is an international multicenter prospective study of 29,000 patients of which about 5% developed ARF, at that time it was called acute renal failure. And you can see the various uh, uh, reasons why patients develop ARF. So septic shock, major surgery, hypovolemia, hepatorenal syndrome, obstructive uropathy, all these are the reasons why patients develop AKI. So here the figures are similar. Even in 2005, 52% ICU mortality, 60% hospital mortality, and 13.8% people required renal replacement therapy by way of dialysis, even at the time of discharge. That means 
uh, indicating chronicity. So the figures have not changed much in spite of all the knowledge which we have acquired and in spite of the good technology which we have. Now, how does this apply to you? That means managing AKI, knowing about AKI, why is it important? No matter what specialty you go into, you must understand the kidneys because you can have post-operative renal failure. In obstetrics and gynecology, there are many issues which I'll show you one slide on why kidneys are important. In pediatric population, you have HUS, you have minimal change disease. In radiology, you have contrast-induced renal failure, both due to CT scan and MRI. In ENT, again, you have pulmonary renal syndromes. And of course, you require pathology for identifying the process of AKI. Now, generally speaking, when you address this issue of AKI, this is the framework for the management of AKI. So recognition is very important. Early recognition, I would say. Before that, there is something called a risk assessment. That means any patient who is admitted, you must do a risk assessment and find out whether this patient is at risk of developing a kidney injury. Then early recognition is important. Once you have recognized, it is very important that early intervention and your responses should be as quick as possible. Of course, you should stage the AKI and then if required, you should give renal support. And then at the end of the day, once the patient is treated, rehabilitation is also important. So these are the five R's which are required for a patient who develops AKI for optimum care. Now, in recent times, what we have done is we have tried to find out who is at increased risk. So let's start, take a patient who has normal kidneys and somebody who has increased risk. Now, who is at increased risk? Any uh, patient who is diabetic, hypertensive, immunosuppressed, on multiple medications, who has multiple organ involvement, all these individuals would be at high risk. Once you are at high risk, there should be, there should be some reasons why the kidneys get affected. So that is called as the stage of renal damage. And it is our endeavor that early detection in people who are at increased risk and just when the kidneys are getting damaged, that is the point where you must detect a KI. And that is the time for early intervention. Once the kidney is damaged and gone into renal failure, then there are only two or three outcomes. Either the patients can progress to end-stage renal disease or there's a partial recovery or there's a full recovery and partial recovery can progress to chronic kidney disease. So therefore, if you are diagnosing people at this stage of kidney failure, then that is a late detection. And generally speaking, we are diagnosing late because by the time the serum creatinine rises and oliguria occurs, you are already having kidney failure. So therefore, our endeavor should be to diagnose it as early as possible. One more important point which we must mention is that anybody who develops AKI, that there is a crosstalk between the kidneys and various organs in the body. So for example, the kidneys, they have some effect on the lung. And what happens in the lungs is that there is increased vascular permeability and there are some cytokine release and therefore there is uh, altered responses to ventilator associated injury. As far as the liver is concerned, again, you have uh, the problems related to oxidation and you will have a lot of problems related to the liver and the kidney. GI tract is related to the channel inducing factor and potassium excretion. Heart, again, we know that there is a good connection between the heart and the kidney and acute kidney injury can also affect the heart causing a cardiorenal syndrome. And of course, in the brain, there are some changes taking place because of the change in the milieu interior. So it's important to remember that AKI can affect all the organs in the body. Now, once we have looked at the background and the epidemiology, how do you define and classify AKI? So as we know that the quality of AKI, AKI diagnosis has improved over a period of time. So in the 1950s, you didn't have any tools to diagnose AKI early, you are diagnosing it only on the basis of oliguria and uremia. But after that, P 
people have tried to define AKI or ARF, and there are 35 different definitions which are available. But we are not going to discuss all of them. But remember that as the pathophysiological understanding of AKI has improved over a period of time, then you will understand the severity, the mechanisms, and then ultimately we are going to have a conceptual model for early diagnosis and treatment. So there are two important classifications <coughs> which are uh, clinically used. One is called as the rifle criteria for AKI and second is the akin criteria for AKI, which I will elaborate to some extent. And there's something called as uh, subclinical AKI where the kidneys are stressed and the kidneys are at risk. So that was identified almost into 2013. And nowadays, conceptually, when you want, you want to diagnose AKI, you have clinical parameters, biochemical parameters, but now you are talking of cellular and molecular biology to diagnose AKI as early as possible. So AKI is defined as an increase in serum creatinine by more than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter within 48 hours, or the rise in serum creatinine should be more than 1.5 times the baseline as compared to the previous value, or and a urine volume which is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than six hours. So criteria for AKI diagnosis would be serum creatinine, then the change in serum creatinine and the urine volume. So <clears throat> ADQI, which is called as the Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative, has developed this rifle criteria. Rifle means risk, injury, failure, loss, and ease in stage kidney disease. So the rifle criteria will tell us what is the stage of kidney disease. And remember that AKI can occur on a background normal kidney function, or it can also occur on a background CKD. Now, the ADQI group published the rifle classification. And later on in 2007, the Acute Kidney Injury Network, AKIN, it modified the rifle criteria and classified AKI again. So we have tried to use both the rifle criteria and the AKIN criteria for diagnosis of AKI. Also, we know that the nephrology guidelines given by KDGO, that also defines AKI. So here, you can see in this table, the rifle criteria for diagnosis of AKI based on risk, injury, failure, loss, and progression to age stage in a disease. The AKIN criteria, again, based on serum creatinine, the urine output, and the change in serum creatinine. And the KDGO criteria are also similar. There are some minor differences as far as uh, the uh, urine output and the change in serum creatinine is concerned. But generally speaking, all these criteria look similar because it is clinical and it helps you to take your decisions based on these criteria. So the GFR criteria and urine output criteria for rifle. So uh, you can see here that if the serum creatinine is, is more than one and a half times the baseline, or the GFR has reduced by more than 25%. And injury means the serum creatinine is more than 2. Or the GFR has reduced by more than 50%. Failure means the serum creatinine is more than 3. And the GFR has reduced by 75%. And of course, loss is persistent AKI. And urine output criteria remain the same. 0.5 ml per kg per hour and 0.3 ml per kg per hour. There's a rifle criteria based on serum creatinine and EGFR. And AKIN criteria are again similar. I will not uh, repeat the same thing again. But remember that this was, uh, this was defined by the Acute Kidney Injury Network and published in, in 2007. And the increase in serum creatinine must occur in less than 48 hours. So what are the advantages of this classification? It, uh, this classification tells us that there is a high sensitivity for early diagnosis, which is very important. And we also detect patients who are at risk and also those who have established AKI. So therefore, it is very important for us to remember uh, or to diagnose patients who require renal replacement therapy. Now, if the KDGO stage of AKI is less than seven days, then remember that the stage can worsen. 
So here you can see that the definitions have changed slightly. If you have AKI, then by definition, the kidney injury or the renal failure is less than seven days. But if it is ongoing for a longer time, then nowadays it is beyond seven days. It is called as AKD, which is acute kidney disease. Remember that the AKD term was, uh, was not defined for a very long period of time. But now people have defined AKI followed by acute kidney disease, which can last up to 90 days. And more than 90 days, if the renal failure persists, then obviously it is chronic kidney disease. So therefore, we must understand the concept of acute kidney disease also. Now, what are the risk factors for developing AKI? Uh, a lot of comorbidities like heart disease, liver disease, genetic factors, uh, 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 CKD, advanced age, etc., etc. Then clinically, a lot of things uh, uh, are important to find out if there's a risk of AKI. For example, sepsis, volume depletion, leptomyelitis, surgery, uh, uh, liver disease, etc., etc. And of course, many drugs are implicated for as a risk factor, if you don't use the right dose or the right duration, then obviously you, are, you might get AKI. Now, once you get AKI, what are the consequences? So these are the consequences. Basically, the patient becomes immunosuppressed and therefore the incidence of infection rises. So all renal failure patients are immunosuppressed and there's a higher chance of infection. Then these people develop fluid overload they also developed hyperinflammatory states and they also require uh, renal replacement therapy and the complications of renal replacement therapy. All of this leads to sepsis. So therefore, remember that acute kidney injury and sepsis may go hand in hand by, because of various mechanisms. I also mentioned that the obstetrics and gynecology branch also has got a lot of implications as far as the kidneys are concerned. So when you have pregnancy-related AKI, these are the etiologies which are possible. So you can have hypovolemia because of hemorrhage, sepsis, congestive heart failure because of the fluid overload, mechanical obstruction, neoplasms. Then you can have thrombotic microangiopathies, health syndrome, preeclampsia, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, acute interstitial nephritis. All these can happen in pregnancy-related AKI, so the differential diagnosis is pretty vast. If you do a renal biopsy in a patient of acute tubular necrosis, you can see here that the tubular, you can see glomeruli as well as tubules here. And you can see that the tubular lumen is filled with hyaline and fibrin cast. So you can see this is a, uh, this is a cast which is inside the tubular lumen. This is the glomerulus, which is the uh, along with the mesangium and the cells. And this is a tubule and this is filled with a cast. Similarly, you can see that there is a frank necrosis of the tubule. So you can see that the margin of this particular tubule is gone and it is all blurred. And there are foamy cells which have seen in the tubular lumen. So therefore, there is complete occlusion of the tubular lumen here. Again, indicating that this is tubular injury and acute tubular necrosis. So therefore, histopathology can also be very, very important to diagnose the cause of AKI. Now, how do you diagnose AKI? Currently, the diagnostic modalities are standard ones, which all of us practicing physicians know. We must uh, uh, take a good history as far as patient's uh, cause of AKI is concerned, find out whether the patient was hospitalized outside, what medications the patient was taking, and then try and find out what investigations can be done. So you can do a urine analysis. I have some elaborate slide on that. You can, of course, do the renal function by of way of urea creatinine. You can do a peripheral blood smear to find out if there is thrombotic microangiopathy or uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, or hemolysis, eosinophilia, and, of course, the other investigations which indicate hyperinflammatory states. Also, the complications related to AKI like hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis will also require some investigations. So in AKI, if you look at the urine and if it is normal or bland, remember that you can diagnose pre-renal AKI or a post-renal AKI. 
If the sediment is abnormal and if the patient has got hematuria, RBC cast and proteinuria, then one must suspect a glomerulopathy or a glomerular disease or a vasculitis or a thrombotic microangiopathy. If you see WBC cast in the urine, then it is a case of pyelonephritis or interstitial nephritis. If you see eosinophils, then it can be acute interstitial nephropathy or, or retroempolic AKI. If you see pigment cast in the urine, it can be related to myoglobin urea or hemoglobin urea. If you see crystal urea, then again, depending on the type of crystals, you can see that it could it can be related to toxic injury. And of course, if you see a non-albumin protein urea, that means predominantly the globulins, then it can be a paraproteinemia. Now, how do you differentiate between a pre-renal AKI versus ATN or a established AKI? There are many criteria. So if the urine sodium is less than 10 or 20, if the urine osmolarity is more than 500, if the specific gravity is more than 1020, if the fractional excretion of sodium is less than 1% and the response to fluid challenge is positive and usually the urine sediment is bland or rarely you can get some highline cast because of hemoconcentration, then this is pre-renal AKI. As compared to that, if the osmolarity is low, if the urine sodium is between more than 40 or if the specific gravity is less than 10, fractional sodium, excretion of sodium is more than 1% and the response to fluid challenge is poor and you have active urinary sediment, then this could be a case of acute tubular necrosis. Now, in the recent past, we have a lot of biomarkers which have come. Now, what are the clinical markers of acute kidney injury? Reduced GFR and raised serum creatinine. I must mention here that the term ARF is now restricted only to people who require renal replacement therapy. That means if you have a patient who whose kidneys are affected and he has got a high urea creatinine but does not require a renal replacement therapy, then the term is called as AKI. But once that patient develops, requires renal replacement therapy, then you should change it to acute renal failure requiring renal replacement therapy. And of course, I told you about acute kidney disease up to 90 days and then beyond that it is CKD. So the clinical markers would be of course reduced GFR and raised serum creatinine. This is a formula by which you calculate the GFR. You know that on Google search you can do a you can type MDRD GFR calculator and then you can calculate the GFR based on uh, the model. Uh, it just requires your body weight and serum creatine and then you can get your GFR. And the CG formula is also there which you can use otherwise. But remember that creatine is a poor marker of renal function. Why? It, it's an indirect marker. It is not elevated in early stages of kidney disease. Till the GFR falls to more than 50 to 60 percent, the serum creatinine is still normal. So therefore, a small elderly person may have a totally normal creatinine in spite of a reduced creatinine clearance because of a poor muscle mass. So therefore, creatinine per se is not a very good indicator of uh, changes in renal function. And this is the relationship between GFR and serum creatinine in ARF. And you can see here, it is not a linear relationship. It is very easy to understand that as the GFR falls, the serum creatinine should rise. And that should be a linear equation. However, this is not so. The creatinine rises after a very long time. You can see here that the creatinine is rising even uh, when the GFR has fallen to less than 60. Otherwise, at the GFR between 80 to 60, the creatinine is still normal. So, therefore, it's a poor marker of renal function. And example, a serum creatinine of 1 does not represent the same level of GFR in a cachectic 70-year-old individual as compared to a highly muscular younger person. So, the abrupt drop in GFR it can be seen if you calculate the GFR, but the creatinine does not rise in spite of the abrupt fall in GFRs. Therefore, that if you base only on creatinine, then the diagnosis can be delayed. Therefore, one must remember that there are other markers. So, initially, when you have a reduced GFR, then what are the markers available? You have serum creatinine and cystatin C. 
Decreased tubular function, the fractional excretion of sodium. Upregulated proteins, there are some biomarkers which I will tell you. And then the other response is to injury. So remember that we are not using biomarkers optimally. So whenever there is an ICU admission and renal injury occurs, then we are diagnosing only when the serum creatinine rises or the urinal drops. And then, of course, you will uh, treat the patient. But if you are utilizing biomarkers, then you are going to diagnose renal injury much early and take the necessary steps for treatment. What are the biomarkers? NGAL. So NGAL is produced by tubular epithelial cells and neutrophils. It is filtered at the glomerulus and this is captured by the proximal tubular cells. Both serum and urine NGAL can be measured and uh, the uh, 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 for prognosis and for diagnosis, there are some studies to show that it is quite useful. So NGAL, the role is, uh, uh, remember that it is, comes from the proximal tubules and there are some cutoff values. And if you do it properly, and if you do serial NGALs, then probably you can diagnose AKI early. And what is the full form of NGAL? Neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. So therefore, NGAL is a test which is now available. Both urine and serum NGAL can be done. So it can be a discriminator of AKI in unselected emergency department patients. And there was one study to show that you, as soon as the patient comes to the ED, you can do an NGAL test. <clears throat> the second biomarker which is used is IL-18. Junior IL-18 levels in AKI are slightly high. The third biomarker which is used is LABP, LFABP, which is liver fatty acid binding protein. Now remember that NGAL is available commercially. But the other ones, IL-18, LFABP, and the NAG, these are not available <clears throat> commercially. So we are not doing it on a routine basis. There are some confounding factors also as far as biomarkers are concerned. So if you have uh, active nephritis, UTI, then of course you should be careful as far as the interpretation is concerned. If I have to draw a simile between cardiac biomarkers and the renal biomarkers, you can see as far as the heart is concerned, you can see here that initially there is a rise in myoglobin, then the troponin rises and then the other CPK and the other CPK MB, all these uh, parameters, they rise. As far as the kidney is concerned, you can see that NGAL is the first one to rise, which is comparable to CPK MB, but it is after myoglobin. That means NGAL is the at present earliest test which is available to us to diagnose kidney injury. And of course, then the other tests, creatinine and GFR, I have already elaborated. So what, what should be, if you get a biomarker test positive, what should be the response? You must monitor the patient intensively, look at the fluid balance, monitor the blood pressure, cardiac function, electrolytes, as well as kidney function. And of course, do no harm. That means no hypotension, no hypovolemia, treat oliguria, and avoid nephrotoxic medications. And of course, intervention is also required. Now, it, unfortunately, in AKI, we don't have initial response as soon as you detect kidney injury. Like in cardiology, you have an initial response. As soon as you detect uh, acute coronary syndrome, you are going to give various drugs to open up the coronaries. But this is still not a reality as far as kidney injury is concerned. There are some experimental medications which we are which we are, people are looking at. So vasodilators, uh, growth factors, and antioxidants. Whether these can be used early on in AKI, uh, just as you use in acute coronary syndrome, whether these can be used to prevent further progression of AKI. So there are lots of all these are biomarkers. KIM-1 is also an emerging biomarker, including IL-18, but they are still not available. Just I'll mention about cystatin C. Cystatin C is commercially available to us. We are using it whenever you are doubting the creatinine value, we are using it. It is a, it is a better uh, indicator of uh, renal function because it is not affected by the muscle mass and other factors. So therefore, if you are in doubt, you can always ask for cystatin C, which is also available. Now let us look at the approach to a patient of AKI once you are diagnosed. So once you are diagnosed, then the approach is very standard, which all practicing physicians know. Pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal 
AKI. The operating of AKI, the incidence is almost 55%, intrinsic AKI 40% and 5% is postrenal. What are the causes of prerenal AKI? Intravascular volume depletion and arterial underfilling because of reduced cardiac output or peripheral vasodilatation because of sepsis or uh, anaphylaxis. So the prerenal AKI can be because of low blood volume, poor heart, uh, poor cardiac output, or it can be because of peripheral vasodilatation. And sometimes you can have intrarenal hemodynamic changes because some drugs, they will cause afferent arterial vasoconstriction. So the blood supply to the kidney goes down and some drugs can cause afferent arterial vasodilatation. Again, that can contribute to a pre-renal AKI. What are the causes of intrinsic AKI? You can have uh, uh, tubular causes, vascular causes, glomerular causes, and interstitial causes. So when you are sus uh, when you have differentiated between a pre-renal and a renal AKI, then in your mind you are supposed to subclassify the cause of AKI, whether it's a glomerular disease, a vascular disease, tubular disease, or an interstitial disease. So ATN, there are many causes. Mainly it can be ischemia, it can be due to nephrotoxic drugs, or it can be due to endogenous toxins like myoglobin, hemoglobin, or uric acid. All these causes uh, are important as far as ATN is concerned. And whenever there is ATN or ischemic injury, then what happens is that there is a, there is a secretion of norepinephrine and angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction because this is important to maintain the renal blood flow. But if the renal autoregulatory mechanisms fail, then there is ischemic injury to the renal parenchyma. And this is due to endothelial dysfunction, epithelial cell, cell, cellular injury, as well as medullary congestion. So this is about the acute tubular necrosis or tubular causes of intrinsic renal failure. Then you have vascular causes. You can have vascular thrombosis. Uh, both renal vein and artery, uh, uh, arterial thrombosis. You can have diseases of glomeruli and renal microvasculature like vasculitis, uh, TTP, DIC, uh, glomerulonephritis, etc. Et then you can have an interstitium which is affected in intrinsic AKI. So acute interstitial nephritis is pretty common. It can be due to infection like bacteria, virus or others. Or it can be due to drug hypersensitivity due to various drugs. So AIN is also a very common occurrence. Post-renal, of course, I don't need to elaborate. This is basically because of obstruction. And we need to diagnose it as early as possible because it is highly treatable. So now let me just take you through the approach of a patient who has acute kidney injury. So what I have told you up till now is the classification, early diagnosis, and now let us talk about the approach. So now, of course, you take a good clinical history, you do a proper examination to detect hypovolemia, then you do the laboratory test and try and find out whether it is a pre-renal AKI, whether it is intrinsic AKI, or whether it is a post-renal AKI. And if it is a pre-renal AKI, then you must look at volume depletion or effective circulatory blood volume. If it is intrinsic AKI, do the right investigation, which I have already told you, to find out what are the causes related to glomeruli, vessels, tubules, or interstitial. And post renal, of course, you will find out if the bladder is palpable, or ultrasound or a CT scan will tell you whether there is an obstructive uropathy. So you will assess the patient for chronic conditions because it could be acute on chronic kidney disease. And depending on the history, you can try and find out what is the probable cause of AKI. And then, of course, you will assess the patient for volume depletion and the hemodynamic status. So the first step for all of us to do is to check the volume and the hemodynamic status. So physical examination is very important. Vital signs, I need not tell this audience about the vital signs. But remember that postural drop of blood pressure can tell you that this is a hypovolemic state. Similarly, if there are some uh, vasculitis, then you can see some skin uh, changes. And of course, uh, if the patient is acidotic or in heart failure, you can see the uh, signs of that. So therefore, the next step as far as assessing the patient is concerned is 
obtain a thorough and accurate drug history. And then once you have taken the drug history, then you must have a proper plan. What are the short-term goals of AKI management? Minimize the degree of insult to the kidney, reduce the extra-renal complications which are related to other organs, and expedite the patient's recovery of renal function. Now, renal recovery can be facilitated by proper monitoring and the injury can be minimized by avoiding all uh, uh, further reasons why, uh, why the kidneys can be affected. For example, the injury can be minimized by protoxic drugs or the other factors which can affect the kidney. So, in practice, how do you think? First thought, is the AKI drug induced? Is it ischemia, inflammation or sclerosis? And then you should have the plan of action. So as far as the plan of action is concerned, remember that the KDGO has given us a very nice chart for a stage-based management of AKI. So those people who are at high risk of developing AKI, then you must do all these things for, uh, from treatment point of view. Discontinue all nephrotoxic drugs, ensure volume status and perfusion pressure, consider functional hemodynamic monitoring, monitor the renal parameters, and uh, avoid radio contrast procedures. So this is for all people who are at high risk or in stage 1, 2, and 3 of AKI. If the patient has already developed AKI, then do not uh, use invasive diagnostic workup as far as possible. Then, of course, you should check the drugs and the doses of the drugs. And later on, these people require renal replacement therapy. So this is how you are going to manage or the plan of action for AKI. Now, let me uh, go through some specific uh, treatments because there are a lot of things which are important from management perspective. First is fluid management. Now, remember that in fluid management of AKI, you have to be very, very precise. You cannot have hypervolemia, which is highly detrimental to the kidney. You cannot have hypovolemia because that will further enhance the acute tubular necrosis. So it is ideally, you should be monitoring these patients by way of a central venous monitoring or clinical monitoring. And of course, you should be using the uh, 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 drugs like uh, norepinephrine to maintain the blood pressure. Now the question in all patients of AKI, and this is a debate between surgical colleagues and physicians to fill or not to fill. So therefore, remember that you must assess the patient properly. Empiric fluid resuscitation triggered only by the serum creatinine level is not correct. All research has shown that edematous kidneys or kidneys which are exposed to hypervolemia, they are definitely not going to do well. So therefore, avoid excessive fluids and fluid tolerance has to be judged properly and also look at the cardiac function. So you have to judge cardiac output versus renal perfusion and fluid tolerance versus fluid responsiveness. And there are some newer methods. So for example, you have what is called as a VEXA score. So what is VEXA score? It is venous excess ultrasound score. It takes into consideration your parameters which are checked on ultrasound at the level of IVC, the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the intrarenal vein. And there's a score which will assess the index and the flow patterns you know, at all these levels and diagnose venous congestion. So the VEXA score will provide you a lot of specific information as far as whether the patient is congested or whether the patient is hypovolemic. And if the VEXA score is high, then obviously that will warn you that your fluid management is improper. So in the ICU, you can use this as a solution. Also, of course, in all these patients, you can do CVP monitoring. If you don't have, uh, uh, you can also do IVC monitoring and do clinical monitoring to find out what is the fluid status. Now, as far as treatment of the hypovolemia is concerned, we have a choice between colloids and crystalloids. So if I talk of colloids, then you have natural colloid, which is albumin, and a synthetic colloid, which is in the form of dextran, starch, or gelatin. Now remember that in AKI, synthetic colloids are totally contraindicated. So therefore, 
If you have to use a colloid, then you have to use a natural colloid like uh, albumin. Now, colloids have a longer duration of effect as far as the intravascular space is concerned, but it can lead to volume overload also. So therefore, one must remember this. Now, what about crystalloids? Now, these are the common crystalloids which are used in practice. Plasma, the normal cell line, lactated ringer, ringer and the plasma light. Normal plasma, that means our blood contains all these, uh, all these uh, parameters. The normal cell line has sodium of 154, chloride of 154, osmolarity of 308. Ringer lactate has got a, a chloride of 109 and the sodium of 130. Plasma light has got a sodium of 140 and a chloride of 98, which is lower in chloride. Now, is chloride bad in IV fluids? There is a lot of literature on this. Remember that if you give normal saline, it is high in chloride. High serum chloride is associated with renal vasoconstriction and reduced GFR. So therefore, normal saline is also associated with a dilutional metabolic acidosis. So what is the strategy? Chloride liberal versus chloride restrictive fluid administration. This is one study which had two arms, chloride liberal arm and the chloride restricted arm. And here it was very clearly seen that in a chloride restricted situation, people did better as compared to chloride liberal situation. And the need for renal replacement therapy or progression of renal failure was lower in the chloride restricted group. So therefore, we are talking of what is called as balanced crystallite solution versus normal saline. So we have two or three trials, large number of patients, 13,000 and 15,000 patients. And here they again showed that lower chloride formula is better as compared to high chloride formula. And this is shown in some trials. So we have to choose our IV fluid replacement therapy uh, judiciously. The second thing, important thing, which we are doing commonly is sodium, sodium bicarbonate because most of these patients have metabolic acidosis. Remember that you, when you are using sodium bicarbonate and you are using 8.4% concentration, then the osmolarity is very high and there is no effect on serum potassium. But large doses of sodium bicarbonate will reduce the potassium, which you already know because that is a standard treatment for hyperkalemia. But if you give soda bicarb as a rapid IV bolus, it can cause a transient fall in mean arterial pressure. So therefore, remember that intracellular acidosis may worsen when this large doses of sodium bicarbonate are used. So therefore, use sodium bicarbonate uh, judiciously, pro probably infusions are better as compared to boluses. Of course, you have to calculate the deficit of bicarbonate and then you, uh, give the right dose. Initially, a bolus may be required, but remember that rapid IV bolus also has some disadvantages. What is the role of vasopressors? We have a lot of vasopressors which are used in the ICU, norepinephrine, vasopressin, terlipressin, phenylephrine, angiotensin 2, which is now, which may be commercially available now. Celepressin is still not available. So therefore, we know that vasopressin is a V1 and V2 receptor antagonist. Now, I'll just tell you something interesting about the vasopressor. Generally speaking, we are using noradrenaline and uh, Noradrenaline obviously uh, is very, very useful because it causes peripheral vasoconstriction. But as far as the kidney is concerned, norepinephrine is an afferent arteriolar vasoconstrictor. So it tends to reduce the glomerular pressure. But if you use norepinephrine, then the kidney perfusion will improve as long as the mean arterial pressure is maintained. But if the mean arterial pressure is low, then you should be using vasopressin because vasopressin has got a unique action on the efferent arteriole and it causes efferent arterial dilatation. So therefore, remember that if you use a combination of norepinephrine and vasopressin in a patient who has got a low mean arterial pressure, then probably you are going to protect the kidneys better because you are going to cause afferent arterial vasoconstriction and I think I, by mistake I said efferent arterial vasodilatation, it should be constriction. 
So you are going to cause efferent and afferent arterial vasoconstriction. If you use a combination of noradrenaline and vasopressin, and in a patient who has got lower mean arterial pressure, consider both these things together. What about diuretics? We are using diuretics. We know that once renal failure occurs, loop diuretics are the only diuretics which can be used. And most studies have said that by using diuretics, it doesn't improve survival. But if the patient passes urine, then obviously it is to our advantage because the patient can be managed much earlier. So what are the diuretics which are available? Flusamide, bumetanide, torsamide, and ethacrylic acid. Normally, we are using loop diuretics IV as well as oral. But if you use IV, then there are some side effects like autotoxicity. There are some rare uh, uh, problems like pancreatitis which can occur. So if you have a patient who is allergic to sulfa, then you cannot use these diuretics. Then you can use the diuretic like uh, other diuretics like ethacrylic acid. So remember that there are a lot of pharmacokinetic Differences as far as loop diuretics are concerned, almost 60% is excreted to the kidneys. And remember that usually there is something called as a ceiling effect. Ceiling effect means beyond a particular dose, the loop diuretic is not going to work. So if you keep on increasing the dose of a loop diuretic, then it becomes futile. And of course, you also develop what is called as diuretic resistance. And this occurs because of various adaptive mechanisms which happen in the kidney because of the loop diuretic therapy. So there is something called as diuretic resistance, which you must understand when you are using large doses of loop diuretics. And there are many causes of diuretic resistance. For example, excessive sodium intake, the inadequate dose, which is used for a longer period of time, concomitant use of NSAIDs, intravascular volume depletion, heart failure, cirrhosis, all these are causes of uh, diuretic uh, resistance. And there are many potential therapeutic solutions depending on the etiology. Now, when you, the patient is on diuretics, the maximum dose of flusamide, which we have used in practice is up to 500 milligrams. Previously, 20 years ago, we used to go up to 1 gram, but now beyond 500 milligrams, we are not using. It can be used as a, uh, either as a bolus or a infusion. I already told you the disadvantages of using a high-dose bolus therapy. So we are preferring infusion or infusion therapy with a uh, frusamide. Torsamide, we can uh, use up to 200 milligrams, and which is equivalent to almost 500 milligrams of frusamide. So here you can see that the, you can use oral or IV and then you can keep on increasing the dose depending on the response. And if the patient has got a high uh, extracellular volume and if you already use loop diuretics, then you can use other diuretics which are uh, in the, which is called a sequential therapy. That means you can you add a thiazide diuretics or you can use uh, diuretics which act at the at the distal tubule. So as far as KDGO is concerned, it is suggested that you cannot use diuretics to prevent AKI, but if there is volume overload, you should be using diuretics. And remember that you have to have a fluid administration strategy, which is conservative as far as treatment is concerned and use the diuretics properly because they can have what is called as a ping pong effect. What is ping pong, ping pong effect? Large doses of diuretics and fluid overload initially can have high GFR and then it can reduce to low GFR because of something called as tubular glomerular feed feedback. One important thing which clinicians can use is called as flusamide stress test, where you can give flusamide 1 milligram per kg IV in people who have not received it before or a higher dose if they have received it before and find out if there's a rise in urine output. If there's a rise in urine output, then the frusimide stress test is responsive. And if it is not, then it is not responsive. And a FST or a responsive frusimide stress test is very, very important because that will tell you about the prognosis also. Now there's something initial nephronal blockade where the other diuretics which you can use along the nephron. So we are already told you about loop diuretics. We are not using acetazolamide, which acts on the proximal convoluted tubule. 
Tolvaptan in rarely circumstances we can use when there is hyponatremia. Metalazone is used in the ascending limb and spironolactone in the distal tubules. So therefore, you can use sequential blockade for progressive diuretic therapy. What is meant by converting oliguric to non-oliguric acute renal failure? It is only because the management becomes easier and you can treat conditions like hyperkalemia. But the prognosis does not change. I already told you about the diuretic resistance. The next important point is drug dosing in AKI. We don't have good guidelines, but you go by the MDRD GFR and then dose your drugs properly. Now you can do it two ways. One is increase the interval of therapy. That means the same dose can be given at a longer interval. For example, 500 milligrams of amikacin which is a nephrotoxic drug, can be given once in 72 hours. Or you can reduce the dose of amikacin and give it on a daily basis, but on a lower dose. So you can give 100 milligrams of amikacin per day, something like that. So therefore, you can either increase the duration or you can increase the reduce the dose. And that is how we generally dose the uh, uh, drugs. Now, dopamine previously, which was used, is now given up. It is said that it causes renal vasodilatation and increases the renal blood flow. But almost all trials have shown that it is not only uh, uh, not useful, but it can cause mesenteric ischemia, uh, ischemia and therefore it is not to be used. Phenol dopam, there are some clinical trials going on with a drug which is a dopamine receptor agonist and it is used in severe hypertension. There are some other effects like vasodilatation of renal vasculature, but we need more trials, including the atrial nitrotic peptide or neseritide or phenolopon in patients of AKI, which I have already mentioned. One such publication showed that uh, uh, it was not really useful. Now, once you have assessed all these parameters, then of course you have to have a proper plan. And the goals of therapy should be that you must monitor the patient. How much fluid is going in and how much fluid is going out. You can do the hemodynamic monitoring, the blood chemistries, the nutritional regimen, etc., etc., And then try and find out whether the patient is being managed properly. And rarely, if the fluid overload is not getting managed because of diuretics, then you are supposed to use ultrafiltration or dialysis. Most of these patients may have hyperkalemia. I will not elaborate on the standard treatment of hyperkalemia, which all of you know. Metabolic acidosis, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hypermagnesemia, and hyponatremia. All these are consequences which can be seen in a patient of AKI. One important thing which we should not forget in management of AKI is nutrition. And remember that these patients are hypercatabolic. So there is some protein restriction which is required, but you must give good amount of calories and sometimes you don't restrict the proteins, you can give normal amount of proteins also. Monitoring of these patients is very, very important and you can use central venous catheters. If you have used all the conservative therapy, which I have already told you, then the patient, some patients may require renal replacement therapy by way of dialysis. So these are the clinical indications for dialysis, AEIOU and biochemical indications, which are standard uremia, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, etc., etc. So acid-base abnormalities, electrolyte imbalance, intoxication, fluid overload and uremia, all these are indications for renal replacement therapy. Now, the modes of dialysis are pretty standard, intermittent hemodialysis, intermittent peritoneal dialysis in some patients, and you can have a continuous renal replacement therapy if there is hemodynamic instability. So, there are many variants of CRRT. You can have a continuous venovenous hemodialysis, a continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, or you can have SLED, which is commonly used, which is called as sustained low efficiency dialysis. I will not go into the details of each therapy because of lack of time. But remember that you must utilize RRT very, very judiciously. And interestingly, this is one comparative study where when do you want to utilize renal replacement therapy? So does early initiation of kidney replacement therapy decrease mortality? 
So this is a comparison of all the clinical trials. So Elaine, Akiki, Ideal ICU, and Start AKI. Now, if you look at all the data, what did they find? AKI severity, the uh, time frame, and how many patients developed the renal replacement therapy, and what was the mortality at, at the end of 90 days. So if you compare all these data, then the final outcome is that early initiation is may not be better. So initially what we thought is that why not dialyze this patient as early as possible because then you will prevent so many complications. But no, all these uh, trials have shown that early initiation is certainly not better. So you have to choose your pa patient properly and choose the extracorporeal therapy properly. So what are the other extracorporeal therapies of blood purification? There are some convective therapies, which, uh, which is CRRT, which I already told you. There's something called as high volume hemofiltration and high cutoff membranes. Then there are adsorption therapies with polymyxin B filter and cytosop, which is using heme adsorption. Then there can be a combination therapy, which is coupled with uh, plasma filtration, which is called as CPFA and combined filtration and adsorption technique which is with the dialyzer, which is called an oxidase. And then of course the other devices are also there. So various types of uh, uh, blood purification therapies are available to us in clinical practice, which you have to use them very, very judiciously. Now, prevention is of course very, very important and the goals of prevention are obvious. Now remember that complete avoidance of all potential causes of renal injury, which you should be knowing, and removal of all the additional insults. These are the standard things for prevention of AKI. Now, whether you can do something pharmacologically to prevent AKI, there are many trials going on. ANP, which is atrial nitrate peptide, diuretics, Dopamine, which is given up, phenol dopam, isotonic saline, N-acetylcysteine, sodium bicarbonate, and vasopressor. Whether you can use this for prevention of occurrence of AKI. Again, uh, that is uh, still experiment. Now, contrast nephrotoxicity, there are standard recommendations to prevent AKI, but let me tell you in a nutshell that isotonic sodium chloride and to some extent sodium bicarbonate there are only two agents which have been shown in randomized trials to, to protect the kidneys from a contrast-related injury. And acetylcysteine we are using routinely, but the, do the evidence is both plus minus in favor and against acetylcysteine. But isotonic normal saline and bicarbonate we should be using in all patients of AKA, uh, all patients who are exposed to contrast media and uh, they have to be given that particular investigation. So experimentally, I also, also told you about phenol dopam, but there is a drug called insulinic growth factor, which is also being used in patients of surgical procedures. So at the end of my talk, what I have tried to do is to tell you regarding how to uh, suspect AKI, how to diagnose AKI early, what is the classification of AKI, how do you, what are the investigations? What are the newer biomarkers? What is the clinical approach uh, of, for a patient of AKI? How do you prevent AKI? And what are the clinical situations where critical decisions can be taken as far as fluid therapy, as far as uh, use of vasopressors, as far as diuretics, and as far as uh, the use of other drugs and dose adjustment. So this is how we manage AKI currently. These are the references for your uh, information. And at the end of my talk, I'll just give you a take home message. Early detection of AKI is very, very important. You can use biomarker judiciously and find out whether you can prevent further renal injury. You must use sonography and Doppler to find out the volume status because I already showed you one more slide that the renal resistive index is something, again, which is used on a routine basis to find out whether the kidney is at risk. Balanced crystalloid solutions and albumin can be used. A frucemide stress test will tell you whether the patient can be responding or no. You can use a combination of noradrenaline and vasopressin in the ICU if the mean arterial pressure is on the lower side. I already told you the physiological basis for that. Early renal replacement therapy is not better, but 
the you must do it at the right time and for the right indication. Avoid nephrotoxic drugs and of course use bicarbonate cautiously. So with that, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all. And uh, I hope that uh, this uh, particular endeavor was definitely of use to all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Deodhat Kafekar. I thank Dr. Deodhat Kafekar for his excellent and comprehensive lecture. I'm sure our audience has uh, benefited abundantly. Uh, so we have three questions. Uh, the first one is if uh, Dr. Deodhat is happy to take all the questions. Uh, shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is there uh, a place for IV albumin in AKI? If so, what are the indications? Please explain each indication in detail. Yeah. So whenever you have hypovolemia, then you have a choice between giving crystalloids and colloids to replace the intravascular blood volume. Now, initially, when you are giving a fluid challenge, then of course we are using crystalloids. And I already told you which crystalloid is to be used. When do you use colloids? In a patient, say for example, who has sepsis or who has got a liver disease with a hepatorenal syndrome or you have a patient who has got a leaky membrane, then whatever amount of crystalloids you give, that either it will leak out into the third space, either in the peritoneal space or in the pleural space or the patient has got such a low serum albumin that the arterial blood pressure just doesn't rise and the intravascular volume just doesn't rise. So these are the situations where you can think of using a combination of a crystalloid and a colloid. So the indication which I told you are sepsis with vasodilatation. That can be one indicator where colloids are used. Second is in a patient where crystalloids are not bringing up the intravascular volume. And third, in a patient who has got liver disease with a very low serum albumin and a very low intravascular oncotic pressure. These are the situations where you will use IV albumin. Now, IV albumin is uh, uh, available as 5% or 20% IV albumin. In general, if the volume which is anticipated is less for in increasing the intravascular volume, then you can use 5% IV albumin and that can be used initially uh, once or twice a day. Maximum we are using at one time is 100 ml of IV albumin and you can repeat it on a daily basis if you think that the intravascular volume is there, uh, is, is being benefited by, by giving IV albumin. When do we use 20% albumin? When the serum albumin is so low, that you need a higher concentration of the protein. So therefore, you can use either 5% or 20%, but 20% could be better because it will raise the intravascular volume in a smaller volume. That means 100 ml of 20% albumin would be better as compared to 100 ml of 5% albumin. And then once the, you have given albumin therapy, you are supposed to monitor the intravascular volume clinically as well as by other parameters. And you can, of course, uh, there are some situations where we are giving a colloid followed by a diuretic because once the intravascular volume is high, the kidneys are well perfused and that is the time when the diuretics will also act. So therefore, you can use uh, uh, albumin in this way on a daily basis for some time depending on the requirement. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and the next question is, how common is acute pancreatitis with intravenous loop diuretics? So I mentioned about that because we have seen a few patients with large doses of loop diuretics. So nowadays, if you are giving an infusion, then we don't see it much. But if you are using a high dose like 500 milligrams of flucemide or 200 milligrams of torsemide, you can see rarely, the incidence could be about less than 1%, but rarely you can see acute pancreatitis. And when the doses were higher, of course, the incidence was higher. Uh, next one is, how long does it take to clear prosomite-induced metabolic alkalosis? 
So yes, that's a good question. The uh, loop diuretics, they cause metabolic alkalosis. Now remember that the loop diuretics will stay into the circulation at least for 8 to 14 hours. Now, if you are giving uh, large doses of loop diuretics, then the alkalosis will stay. But suppose you have given one dose of a loop diuretic and then you are not giving any further dose and the patient develops metabolic alkalosis. In clinical practice, the metabolic alkalosis can last for more than 24 hours if it is only due to a loop diuretic. But remember that in our patients, we are giving diuretics. We are also giving intravenous sodium bicarbonate, which can also give rise to metabolic alkalosis. Some patients are on ventilator and there also the respiratory alkalosis, sorry, the respiratory acidosis can result in metabolic alkalosis. So therefore, if you have a patient who has got multiple reasons for metabolic alkalosis and the patient is already on diuretics, then of course he will take a longer time. But considering that the patient does not have any other reason for metabolic alkalosis, the patient is not receiving any sodium bicarbonate, only a loop diuretic, and the patient is not on ventilator, or there is no other cause of metabolic alkalosis, then usually the alkalosis can last up to 24 hours and then it should clear up. In the absence of any more questions, I thank again uh, Dr. Diyotat Shafikar for her, his excellent uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your time and accepting our invitation on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. I'm sure our audience uh, will uh, uh, witness for that. And... Uh, then again, I will thank uh, the council and the president of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine uh, for uh, allowing us to continue with the therapeutic forum. Last but not least, the audience, uh, thank you for attending this lecture and uh, I'm sure that you will be benefited from it. And uh, thank you, Gets Pharma, for facilitating uh, this event uh, to uh, with uh, the Zoom platform. Thank you all very much and good night. Thank you, Dr. Suranga, for this invitation. It was indeed an honor to talk to you. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, all people have benefited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.